This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. It's February, and what comes to mind when the second month of the year rolls around? Well, Valentine's Day, of course. For some, Valentine's Day is something to look forward to as a day to celebrate love and romance. For others, especially if you're currently single, it's a day you might prefer to skip. But I would encourage you, even if you are uncoupled this year, use the day to pamper and treat yourself. Self-love is important, and it's a great idea to remember how special you are and celebrate that. Some of the people I'll be telling you about this month could have used this advice. If they had, they may not have found themselves in terrifying situations that sometimes cost them their lives. In this series, Hookups from Hell, I'll detail cases of people looking for a love match and instead found themselves targeted for murder. In this episode, I'll tell you about a Canadian man who considered himself an aspiring serial killer. He modeled his crimes after Dexter, an American television show that follows the exploits of a sociopathic killer. Before he was caught, he would commit one of Canada's most cold-blooded and grisly murders. This is Chapter 1 of Hookups from Hell, Mark Twitchell, The Dexter Killer. -year 33-year-old Giu Tetro, newly single, decided to try an online dating service. He set up a profile on the plentyoffish.com site to see who would bite. Pardon the pun. Jiu was young, good-looking, and had a steady job as a security officer at a casino, so it wasn't too surprising when he soon began trading messages with the woman interested in meeting him. The woman, who told him her name was Sheena, was an attractive 5-foot-6-inch blonde with blue eyes. She lived locally in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Sheena was eager for the two to meet face-to-face, so they set up a date for Friday, October 3, 2008. Sheena gave Giu directions to her place, where he would meet her at 7 p.m. She didn't give him an address, but instead wrote out a series of directions on how to find her home. Sheena said there wasn't a lot of street parking in front of her house, so he should park around the corner and come through the back of the house by way of an alley. He was instructed to come in through the garage roll-up door. The garage was detached from the home, so he was to walk through a side door and into the backyard. From there, he could reach the back door, Sheena said. It was a bit unusual, but it didn't concern Giu very much. He set out on Friday, excited to be out on a date. He parked his truck around the corner and found the garage where he'd been directed. The door was not all the way up, but just partially so. Jiu, who stood at just under six feet tall, had to duck to get inside. He began walking across the unlighted garage to the side door when he glimpsed a movement from behind him. As he turned to look, a shadowy figure stepped out. It was a male, a bit taller than him and heavier, wearing a dark hooded sweatshirt. His face was covered by a painted hockey mask. The masked man made a quick movement towards him, and Jiu felt a sharp sting before he fell to the garage floor. The masked man stood over him with a wand-like object, which Jiu quickly realized was some kind of stun device. He tried to stand and move back to the partially open garage door, but the man was upon him. He was hit again with the stun gun, and then the masked man took duct tape and placed it over Jiu's mouth. Jiu continued to struggle to get away. His attacker yelled at him to get on the ground and pulled out a second weapon, a gun, and pointed it at him. Jiu wasn't sure what the man was planning to do, rob him, rape him, or kill him, but he decided to fight for what could very well be his life. He was able to get up, pulling the tape off his mouth at the same time. Jiu lunged towards the man and grabbed at the gun. He was surprised that he felt not metal, but plastic. The gun was a fake, he thought. Now the two men continue to struggle, Jiu trying to get out of the garage and the masked man trying to hold him. 
Ji Yu slipped out of his jacket and managed to roll under the garage door. His attacker ran out into the alley after him. Before he could stand up to run, the attacker grabbed Ji Yu by his legs and began dragging him back to the garage. He kicked at him, landing a couple of blows that weakened the masked man's grip on him. That's when Ji Yu saw two people turn the corner into the alleyway. They were walking their dog, and Ji Yu, lying on the ground with the man just a foot away, yelled out, Help! I'm being robbed! The couple stopped in their tracks, and to his great surprise, the masked man calmly chuckled, saying, Frank, stop playing around, or something to that effect. The result was that the couple looked at him warily. His attacker was pretending they were friends. Ji Yu continued to call for help, but the dog walkers looked scared now and quickly walked away. Ji Yu saw that the attacker had retreated back toward the garage. Using what little energy he had left, he got to his feet and ran to his truck. He hopped in and drove away as fast as possible. Once he arrived home and his heart stopped pounding, Ji Yu tried to make sense of what had just happened. Obviously, he realized Sheena didn't exist and the date had been a setup. What the guy had planned to do to him, he wasn't sure, but he was very grateful to have gotten away from whatever horror had been planned for him. After experiencing a rush of relief, the next feeling Gio experienced was embarrassment. He'd been catfished by some weirdo, mask-wearing possible rapist. He'd walked right into a trap. What a dummy, he thought. His embarrassment at being so easily conned stopped him from reporting the incident to the police. Giu Tetro did not have any idea what a lucky break he'd just been handed. The masked man in the hoodie had carefully planned his attack down to almost the last detail. It was something he had been planning for some time. The fact that his victim had escaped was something that would keep him awake for several nights, wondering when the police would come knocking at his door. After a few days, he began to relax. He also started to plan for his next victim. The masked man's name was Mark Andrew Twitchell, and he considered himself an aspiring serial killer. Giu Tetro had been his first hand-picked victim, but he would not be his last. Twitchell was born on July 4, 1979, in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. He grew up in a two-parent intact family, and by all accounts, his life was no different from any other Canadian kid growing up in the suburbs. Nothing stood out as particularly unique or special about Mark Twitchell, but he would say that he'd always felt different from most people for as long as he could remember. In fact, he wrote extensively about how different he considered himself to be from the average Joe. He described some of how he was different in an online journal. Quote, My whole life I've always just done whatever the hell I wanted without any consideration for anyone else, and it's never bothered me. I don't experience things like remorse or guilt, Twitchell claimed. But outwardly, Twitchell projected an appearance of normalcy in his everyday life. He finished high school and entered college. He had a group of college friends who thought of him as a nice, normal guy. Twitchell was of average good looks and didn't have trouble meeting women. In fact, he could be quite charming. While in college at the age of 19, he met a woman who he would consider his first real love. I will just call her Linda. Linda was almost five years Mark's senior, but they hit it off right away. They became friends, but Mark wanted more. In what would always be a pattern of behavior for Twitchell, he started off by lying to Linda. He lied about his age and family background. He never could explain why he did so, but as the relationship progressed and Linda was introduced to his family, she soon put two and two together and discovered all the little white lies her boyfriend had told her. Naturally, she was angry and wondered if she knew Twitchell at all. She broke off the relationship after she insisted he come clean. She realized that he'd been lying to her about many things since they'd first met. She told him she could never trust him and thought it was best that they didn't see each other anymore. Twitchell was devastated. I lost my soulmate, the one true love of my life, and I would never get over it, Twitchell would later write. He would try to contact her later on, but Linda told him she was engaged and cut off contact. 
Twitchell met his first wife, Meg, soon afterward. She was from the United States, and they met online. She traveled to Edmonton to meet him in person, and before long, they were engaged. But soon, old patterns would emerge. Twitchell lied to his wife constantly about his job, his finances, pretty much everything. Then he began cheating on her. He created online profiles on dating sites, and lying to the women he met that he was available, began living a double life. Meg soon caught on, and in 2005, after four years of marriage, she filed for divorce. Within a year, Mark met Tess, the woman who would become his second wife. He had moved back to his hometown of Edmonton and took a series of sales jobs, but aspired to become a filmmaker. In Edmonton, he began creating short films with which he hoped to impress major film studios. It was only a matter of time, Twitchell believed, until he'd be discovered and signed to make a blockbuster film. The genres Twitchell focused on were science fiction and horror. He named his fledgling company Express Entertainment. Twitchell set about to make his dream a reality, renting studio space in the form of a vacant detached garage in the city, hiring actors, production assistants, and a videographer. He would serve as the writer and director. Twitchell and Express Entertainment had some small successes in the mid-2000s. He was able to raise money from a few investors, enough to create a few short, low-budget films. Then in 2007, Twitchell directed a full-length fan film prequel titled Star Wars, Secrets of the Rebellion. But Twitchell was most interested in his next project, a short horror film he titled House of Cards. The movie's premise was the story of a serial killer who selects his victims by posing as a woman on a dating site. After luring men to his home, he tortured and murdered them, dismembering their bodies and disposing of the remains. It was a gory and blood-soaked film inspired by slasher films and Twitchell's favorite television show, Dexter. Dexter, an American television series that aired on the Showtime network from 2006 to 2013, followed the exploits of Dexter Morgan, a police department bloodstained pattern analyst who lives a double life as a serial killer. Dexter's victims are unrepentant criminals who have gotten away with heinous crimes. Dexter's murders are portrayed as a type of vigilante justice as he chooses only victims who, quote, deserve to die. Dexter is able to continue killing without being detected due to his meticulous planning and the way he disposes of the bodies and other evidence. The victims are taken to a kill room constructed by Dexter where he dismembers the bodies. His kill room has been meticulously designed to leave no evidence behind. He then dumps the remains in the Atlantic Ocean. Dexter lives and works in Miami, Florida. He's able to carry out these series of killings, it's explained, because Dexter is a sociopath who is not hindered by human emotions like empathy, guilt, or remorse. Twitchell became enthralled by the show and wrote about how much he related to the main character. He even created a Facebook page using the name and likeness of the actor Michael C. Hall, who plays Dexter, for his profile. Twitchell's film House of Cards was good enough to secure a $30,000 investor, and Twitchell was now sure he was on his way to creating his first feature film. But the dark obsession that had gripped Twitchell for years would now take over his life. Mark Twitchell would actively begin seeking out his first murder victim. If you're like me, you ate way too many not-so-good-for-you treats during the holidays. You might be looking to cut down on sugar and carbs, but still want to satisfy those snack cravings. But some good-for-you snacks I've tried just didn't cut it. They weren't that tasty, to be honest, and didn't satisfy my cravings, so I'd end up backsliding on my intentions to snack healthier. So I'm so glad to have been introduced to Monk Pack's Keto Nut and Seed Bars. They contain less than one gram of sugar, two to three grams of net carbs, and are only 150 calories. And did I say keto? Yes, I did. They're perfect for anyone following a keto lifestyle. I like to keep a variety of Monk Pack Keto Nut and Seed Bars in my studio and my desk drawer. They're easy to grab for a quick, healthy, and yummy snack that doesn't make me feel guilty or cause me to have a sugar crash. And all their flavors are so delicious. 
My favorite right now is coconut almond dark chocolate. And the macadamia white chocolate keto nut and seed bar is so decadent and still only three grams of net carbs. They're also gluten-free, plant-based, and non-GMO and contain no sugar alcohols or artificial colors. Just good for you ingredients that taste awesome. Try for yourself and see. And we have a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first purchase of any Monk Pack product by visiting monkpack.com and entering our code once at checkout. And Monk Pack is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll exchange the product or refund your money, whichever you prefer. To get started, just go to monkpack.com. That's M-U-N-K-P-A-C-K dot com and select any product. Then enter the code once at checkout to save 20% off your purchase. Monk Pack, delicious, nutritious food you can count on. We thank them for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is also brought to you by Scout's Honor. You all might have heard that we brought a new puppy home after the holidays. He's a 10-pound cutie, half French bulldog, and half Tasmanian devil, I think. Well, we've pretty much been together every day since December, and all that quality close contact time has clued me into his daily needs, health, and well-being. Dogs can get itchy sometimes and smell less than puppy fresh, and I want to make sure I'm using only high-quality products on my pup. That's why I appreciate Scout's Honor's line of probiotic pet grooming products. When applied to the skin, probiotics support healthy bacteria and fight against bad bacteria that can cause irritation. Scout's Honor products also come in amazing fragrances. My favorite is Honeysuckle, but the lavender fragrance comes a close second. I also appreciate their probiotic itch relief spray, great for both dogs and cats. They even have a probiotic deodorizer spray that's great to use in between baths, or when you want to neutralize odors from their skin or coat. It's one of my favorite Scouts Honor products. To receive 20% off your first order, go to scoutshonor.com slash once. That's scouts with a K at scoutshonor.com slash once for 20% off your order. Scouts Honor, natural and preventative grooming solutions for pets. Writing, directing, and producing a slasher film about luring unsuspecting victims into a trap, torturing and killing them, didn't provide enough satisfaction for Mark Twitchell. He now took measures to have his all-consuming fantasy leap off the page and into reality. The garage he'd rented to shoot his films would now become his kill room. The garage was a double-detached space located in a quiet neighborhood. The people who lived in the house were renters who never made use of the backyard, much less the garage that was yards away. Twitchell knew it would afford him the privacy he needed. If anyone did hear noises coming from the garage, yelling or even calling for help, Twitchell knew they'd probably assume he was filming another horror movie. He'd made sure all the neighbors knew about his work, placing notices in each mailbox when he'd first set up the studio. It was the perfect cover, he thought. Twitchell hung plastic sheeting from the walls of the garage and covered the floor. He'd built a table four feet wide by six feet long with a stainless steel top. He blocked the windows with boards and removed the address plaque from the back of the building, which backed up to a quiet alleyway. Neighbors' homes were hidden behind high fences. Twitchell purchased a stun baton and an airsoft pistol, which resembled a real gun, if one didn't look too closely. He also purchased a hunting knife with an eight-inch blade and a hunter's game processing kit. The kit contained a set of tools used to butcher large animals like deer and other game. He also equipped the room with a 45-gallon steel drum. These last items would be used for the disposal of the body. Finally, Twitchell readied a dark green hoodie and a hockey mask. He customized the mask by cutting out the mouth and painting gold streaks on it for, quote, dramatic effect. Now all Twitchell needed was a victim. He thought the easiest thing would be to pose as a woman looking for love and lure his male victims to his kill room with the promise of a date. Like Dexter, Twitchell thought of looking for a, quote, guilty party to eliminate. He thought of luring a married man who, by responding to a dating website, would be cheating on his wife and therefore deserving of his fate. This was ironic, since Twitchell had cheated on both of his wives multiple times. 
but this wasn't the reason he decided against selecting a cheating husband as a victim. It was merely logic that drove Twitchell to choose a completely innocent man to target for murder. Twitchell reasoned that a single man who lived alone would not be missed immediately. This would give him time to complete the act of killing and dispose of the body before anyone came looking for his victim. Online dating sites also had the added bonus of providing physical details of the potential victim. He wanted someone who he could more easily subdue, a man who was between 5 feet 7 and 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighing between 150 and 180 pounds, both shorter and smaller in build than himself. Twitchell created a dedicated email address and a fake dating profile using photos from another social media account he came across online. Before long, he had several responses from interested men in his email box wanting to meet his fake persona, Sheena. He chose Gio Tetro to respond to because he most closely fit the profile he'd hoped to attract. But as I described at the beginning of the episode, Gio did not go down easily as Twitchell had hoped. His first mistake, Twitchell later analyzed, was using the stun baton to try to subdue his victim. He had envisioned only needing to strike him once with the stun baton to render him helpless. Twitchell then planned to place the victim in a sleeper hold until he was unconscious. Then he would slice his throat with the hunting knife to both silence his victim immediately and kill him quickly. The body would be placed on the table where it would be dismembered before being disposed of. Experiencing the act of killing someone was just one motivation for the aspiring serial killer. In addition, Twitchell also had a profit motive. He had quit his day job as, ironically, a salesperson for the security company ADT and had not had a paying position for several months. He kept this from his wife, leaving at his usual time each day as if going to work. Instead of being gainfully employed, Twitchell had spent days planning and preparing for his career as a serial killer. He'd been dipping into the money given to him by his film investor in order to pay the bills. Targeting single men that lived alone would also afford him the opportunity to gain access to their residences to steal money and valuables after killing them. But Gio was able to fight back after being hit more than once with the stun baton. Twitchell determined he would not make this mistake a second time, but would vanquish his victim immediately. To do this, he readied a heavy steel pipe that he would use to strike his next victim in the back of the head as soon as he entered the garage. Just a week after his first victim escaped with his life, Twitchell was ready to invite his second to the garage. He created another online dating profile on the website plentyoffish.com. Calling himself Jen, he made contact with 38-year-old John Brian Altinger and set up a date for Friday, October 10th, 2008. John Altinger, called Johnny by his friends and family, was a native of Edmonton. In 2008, Altinger was 38, single, and living alone. His mother, Alfreda, had moved to California after his father had died years earlier. His older brother, Gary, was married with kids. Johnny Altinger had a knack for computers since he was a child. He owned his first computer at the age of 12. Johnny was sought out by adults in the neighborhood for technical help and would continue to hire himself out for computer repairs in his spare time as an adult. Altinger worked the night shift as a quality control manager for Argus Machine Company, an oil-filled equipment manufacturer. He loved motorcycles and often would ride with friends. He owned a small house in Edmonton, and when Canada's oil boom hit in the 1990s, he sold it for a nice profit. With the money he made, he purchased a new condo in the downtown area. Altinger had never married, but had dated several women over the years. He met most of his dates through online dating websites. Finding friends and meeting women online was a natural fit for the computer-savvy Altinger. He was online whenever he wasn't working or riding his motorcycle. It was the way he stayed connected to his friends and family as well. In early October 2008, he was online checking some dating websites when he came across a new profile he hadn't seen before. The woman, Jen, was attractive, educated, and an independent professional who said she loved to travel. She seemed interesting to Johnny, 
so he sent her a message. He was pleasantly surprised when Jen responded quickly. They traded messages back and forth, and she extended an invitation to meet him on the following Friday night. She seemed eager to get together, and Altinger was happy to make a couple of changes to his schedule to make Friday night work. Jen gave him directions to her house, explaining that he should park down the street, walk up to the back of the residence through the alley, and enter through the garage. They scheduled their planned meeting for 7 p.m. With Altinger now selected as victim number two, Twitchell got everything ready to take him by surprise. But it was Twitchell who was surprised when Johnny Altinger arrived 20 minutes early. He ducked under the door and caught his would-be attacker unaware. Twitchell thought up a revised plan on the spot. This came somewhat naturally to him as he was a lifelong pathological liar. He introduced himself as Harry and said he was a filmmaker renting the garage from Jen to make his next film. He had to come up with an excuse as to why the garage looked like a scene out of Dexter. He even showed Altinger the prop gun and some of the other props he said were for his film. He told Altinger that Jen was running late and had called to say she was still about 20 minutes away. Altinger said he would come back and ducked out of the garage. Twitchell paced for 20 minutes trying to decide what to do. Should he still go through with his plan once Altinger returned? What if he had called someone in the meantime and told them all about the weird garage and the filmmaker named Harry? Twitchell decided against carrying through with the plan. When Altinger returned, he gave him the bad news that Jen had called and she had been held up in traffic and wasn't going to make it. Altinger thanked him and left. Twitchell, however, didn't want the night to be a complete waste after all his planning. He jumped back on the dating site to see if one of the other men who'd responded to Jen's profile might be willing to drop everything and agreed to a last-minute date. When he opened up his email, he was surprised to see a message from Altinger. Altinger expressed disappointment that they hadn't been able to meet and wanted to set up another time to get together. Twitchell, responding as Jen, sent back an apology and offered to reschedule for the following day. Altinger, still online, responded immediately. Had she arrived home, he asked? If so, he was willing to drive back as he wasn't too far away. Twitchell couldn't believe his luck. He immediately agreed and, once again, prepared for Altinger's arrival. This time when Altinger walked into the garage, he wasn't surprised to see Twitchell. Twitchell used this to his advantage. Now he didn't bother with the mask or any other pretense. Slightly embarrassed, walking through the garage toward the back door to meet his date, Altinger remarked to Twitchell, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. Twitchell, coming up behind him, responded, You have no idea, before smashing the steel pipe against the back of Altinger's skull. Twitchell had landed a furious blow to Altinger's head with a heavy pipe, but it quickly became apparent to him that killing a man was a much more difficult task than portrayed on television. Altinger fell to the ground but was still conscious. He struggled to stand up and was even able to grab onto the pipe once while Twitchell continued to land blows. He was desperate now for Altinger to stop yelling and lie still. Panicked and furious at his lack of control over the situation, Twitchell unholstered the hunting knife from the sheath on his belt and stuck it into the other man's stomach. He struck him a second time in the neck before he finally stopped moving. Twitchell glanced down at the dead man and, for the first time, noticed the amount of blood soaking the garage floor and walls. All of his careful planning and covering his kill room in plastic had been for naught. Again, something Twitchell did not anticipate. He'd have a big cleanup job ahead of him, he knew, but he had a more pressing problem at the moment, disposing of the body. For this, the rest of his planning was put to use. He transferred the body to his steel table dismembered it, and placed the parts into bags. Afterward, he cleaned the garage using ammonia, which he believed would destroy any DNA evidence. The second time Altinger drove to the garage, he'd foregone the instructions to park down the street, etc., and simply parked his red Mazda in the driveway in the alley. Twitchell now retrieved Altinger's car keys from his jacket pocket and drove the car into the garage, shutting the garage door behind it. He popped the trunk and placed the garbage bags containing the body parts inside. He found Altinger's cell phone and shut it off so that it wouldn't continue to signal its location. 
Huichol cleaned himself up, removing his blood-stained clothes and changing into others he had brought with him. He then locked the garage and drove his own car home, where his wife and infant daughter lay sleeping, blissfully unaware of the grisly crime the young husband and father had just committed. On Saturday, October 11th, Johnny Altinger's good friend Dale Smith was expecting a visit from him, but he never showed up. They had been looking forward to going on a motorcycle ride, so when Dale didn't hear from his friend, he grew concerned. Johnny had told Dale just the previous day that he'd met a woman online and had set up a date for that evening. And Johnny had done one other thing before leaving to meet this new woman. Perhaps he was just cautious. Johnny's friends would say that he was not an impulsive guy, but very responsible, almost an over-planner. Or maybe he had some sort of weird vibe or a sixth sense about this particular date. But for whatever reason, before leaving his house, Johnny forwarded a copy of Jen's email outlining the directions to her house to his friend Dale. After Johnny missed their scheduled meeting, Dale opened up the forwarded email. He noticed that the woman had not given her street address, just a series of directions to her house. As he was contemplating calling the authorities to report his concern, Dale received an email from Johnny. Johnny's email said that he'd met an extraordinary woman named Jen and had decided to take her up on an offer of an impromptu vacation. He was on his way to Costa Rica and said he would be back before the holidays. This message was also sent by email to Altinger's brother Gary and several other friends. His mother, who was away on a vacation in Mexico, also received the strange email from her son. Dale Smith was immediately alarmed by what he read. It didn't sound like Johnny at all, he thought. He would never have left so abruptly, woman or no woman, Dale knew. Another red flag for him was that Johnny always signed off his emails with a joke or a smiley face. This email contained neither. Dale drove by Altinger's house and saw that his car was gone. But he also noticed that Johnny's motorcycle was still in its parking spot and was uncovered. Dale was well aware that Johnny always covered his bike, one of his most prized possessions, when he left for even a short trip. No, something wasn't right, Dale decided. He called the Edmonton police to report his suspicions. But the police, after hearing that a single adult man had apparently met a woman and left on a vacation, didn't immediately take the report seriously. Other friends and family members tried to contact Altinger, but couldn't reach him. His cell phone was going to voicemail, and their emails were not returned. Very unlike Johnny, they said. Several of them also contacted police requesting to open a missing persons investigation. One of his friends printed out the email she had received and showed it to the police. Sent on the Monday after he was last seen, it read, Hey there. I've met an extraordinary woman named Jen who has offered to take me on a nice long tropical vacation. We'll be staying at her winter home in Costa Rica. Phone number to follow soon. I won't be back in town until December 10th, but I'll be checking my email periodically. See you around the holidays, Johnny. Unable to get the police to act, Johnny's friends broke into his condo to see if they could find any clues as to where he might be. Some dirty dishes had been left in the sink, and they didn't see any signs that Johnny had packed a suitcase or that he had planned to be away for an extended period. The only things missing appeared to be his wallet, keys, and car. They discovered one other thing that convinced them that Johnny had not taken an impromptu trip to Costa Rica with a mystery woman. Among his possessions, they found Johnny Altinger's passport. <laughs> Johnny's friends had given the Edmonton police all the information they had to help locate him. The email he'd forwarded to Dale giving directions to his Friday night date had been turned over to the police. An officer had located the garage and discovered it was leased to a Mark Twitchell. The officer had spoken with Mark Twitchell about a week after Altinger was last seen. Twitchell had been cooperative and allowed the police to enter his garage. After a quick look around, police determined that nothing was out of order and there was no sign that John Altinger had been there. Twitchell calmly explained that he had rented the garage to use as a studio where he made films. 
No one had been at the garage on the Friday night in question, he said. It had been locked up tight. A missing persons investigation was begun by the Edmonton Police Department seven days after Johnny Altinger went missing. Two days after that, homicide detectives Bill Clark and Mark Anstey were assigned to the case. The detectives' first order of business was to obtain a search warrant for the garage that the email stated was Altinger's last destination. The address of the garage location was now verified to be 5712 40th Avenue. Detectives contacted Twitchell, who agreed to meet them at the garage on October 19th. When they arrived, Twitchell was there, but said he could not open the door. He said that someone had removed his lock and installed a different padlock, for which he had no key. He couldn't say who might have done this. Detective Clark found this strange, but simply asked Twitchell for permission to cut off the lock. Twitchell agreed. They looked inside the garage, but it was clean and certainly didn't appear at first glance to be a crime scene. The detective then requested that Twitchell accompany them to the police department to be interviewed. Twitchell agreed to this as well. Mark Twitchell appeared calm, cooperative, and friendly during the interview. He gave details about his film career. They learned that he was married and had an infant daughter. Twitchell noted that a few items in the garage were out of place from when he'd last been there. Besides the unfamiliar lock on the garage door, the lights had been left on, he said, and he was sure he'd turned them off when he'd last exited. He also noted that a steel drum he used for a garbage can had been, quote, used as a fire pit. Twitchell gave names and contact numbers of everyone with access to the garage, namely all the people who'd worked on his films. There appeared to be no obvious connection between Mark Twitchell and the missing man. Detective Clark told Twitchell that a search warrant for the garage had been requested and they would be returning to do a thorough search. Twitchell seemed unfazed and said that that would be fine. But a day later, the detectives received a very long detailed email from Mark Twitchell. The subject line read, More info that might be useful. Twitchell said that he'd been very tired when he was interviewed by detectives on that Sunday night and had thought of a few things that had slipped his mind when they'd first spoken. He described a bizarre encounter with a stranger that had taken place the previous Wednesday, October 15th. As he was on his way to the garage, Twitchell said, he pulled his car over to the side of the road to answer a cell phone call. That's when a man knocked on his window. Thinking he was going to ask him for directions, Twitchell rolled down his window. The Caucasian man, who stood about six foot two inches tall with a medium build and black hair, said he had a car he wanted to, quote, get rid of and was willing to sell cheap. The man, who said his name was Mark, which Twitchell said he thought was odd since they shared the same first name, told him that he had just, quote, shacked up with this rich sugar mama who was going to buy him a new BMW, so he wanted to get rid of his old car. Twitchell said that Mark offered to sell it to him for whatever amount of money he had on him. Twitchell told him he only had about 40 bucks, and Mark said that was fine. Twitchell was skeptical, he said, but decided to give the man the directions to the garage and told him to bring the car there. To his surprise, he said, the man showed up with the car. Twitchell gave him the $40, and the man signed a bill of sale. Twitchell told the detectives that the car which was currently parked at a friend's home, was a red 2005 Mazda 3. Bill Clark, who read Twitchell's story with growing suspicion, was taken aback when learning the description of the car he said he'd bought off a stranger for pocket change. It was the exact same color and model as the car belonging to the missing man, John Altinger. Now Twitchell said he was putting things together. The information about the missing man, the strange lock on the garage, and the car he'd bought from the stranger. He wrote, quote, I feel like an idiot having thought this car situation could have been on the up and up. If it's all the same to you, I'd prefer to give the detective I'm meeting tonight the keys to this Mazda and let him check it out, end quote. Bill Clark now believed that Mark Twitchell knew more about Johnny Altinger's disappearance than he was letting on. The car was retrieved and verified to be the property of John Altinger. It was impounded to be processed for evidence. Clark now called Mark Twitchell in for a second interview. It began late in the evening of October 19th, 
and continued into the early morning hours of October 20th. Twitchell again agreed to be questioned. He did not ask for an attorney. He still appeared calm and was very cooperative. Detective Clark described Twitchell as very self-assured, calm, and almost cocky in his demeanor. But he tended to ramble on and talk too much. Clark, a seasoned detective, read this as someone who was trying too hard to appear unconcerned. Twitchell was much too chatty and sometimes talked in circles. Clark came up with an initial theory that perhaps this young filmmaker had lured John Altinger to his garage to make a snuff film, wanting to capture his murder on camera to sell to the sickos who would pay to watch such a thing. Detective Clark had been investigating murders for many years and knew that there was no limit to human depravity. Almost nothing could surprise him anymore. Twitchell was allowed to return home, but Clark continued to investigate him, impounding his car, serving search warrants for his and his parents' homes, and interviewing his wife, friends, and family. They learned from Twitchell's wife, Tess, that she had recently kicked him out of the house after discovering he'd been having an affair with an ex-girlfriend. He was now living with his parents in Edmonton. It was while they were interviewing residents in the neighborhood where the rented garage was located that they came across the couple who'd witnessed another man fleeing the garage chased by a man in a hockey mask. The couple had been suspicious of the scene, not sure if the man on the ground was actually being attacked, if it was a joke, or more likely, they thought, they themselves were being set up to be robbed. Upon hearing their story, Detective Clark thought he was hearing what had happened to John Altinger. The couple, who were boyfriend and girlfriend, were named Marissa Guirini and Trevor Hosinger. They told Clark that they had called the police to report the strange incident upon arriving home that evening. An Edmonton police officer had come out, driven by the garage Marissa and Trevor pointed out to them, but seeing nobody there and nothing out of the ordinary, he'd simply taken the report and left. Clark now pulled the report and discovered that it was dated one week before Altinger had gone missing. Hitting another dead end, Clark decided to share details of the report of the man in the hockey mask with the media in hope that the man in the alleyway might contact the police. The strategy paid off. The friend who Gio Tetro had told about his attack in the garage saw the story on the news. He contacted Gio to inform him that the police were seeking information about the incident as part of a missing persons investigation. Gio contacted the police. Of course, he couldn't positively identify his attacker who'd been masked and hooded, but Clark was now convinced that Mark Twitchell was likely the masked man and was involved in the disappearance of John Altinger. A search warrant was served to seize Twitchell's computer as well as other items from his home. The game processing kit with several cutting weapons that appeared to have dried blood on them was discovered. Evidence of a burn ring was found in the yard of Twitchell's parents' home. But the most incriminating items found were files on Twitchell's computer. A copy of a short film created by Twitchell was discovered in which a man lures his victims to a garage through an online dating site kills him, and then dismembers his body. It appeared to be a blueprint of what investigators suspected had befallen John Altinger. But even more incriminating were deleted files that were able to be retrieved from Twitchell's laptop. One was a file titled SK Confessions, which detectives concluded stood for serial killer confessions. In over 40 pages of text, Twitchell describes in detail his fascination with serial killers. He specifically mentions the fictional character Dexter Morgan. Twitchell wrote in great detail his plans to carry out the murders of strangers, his botched first attempt with Gio Tetro, and the killing and dismemberment of John Altinger. The document, however, ended before Twitchell recorded where he had taken Altinger's remains. He did record, however, how he'd tried to burn the body parts in a barrel on his parents' property while they were away. Twitchell wrote that he quickly realized he would need a much hotter fire and burn the body parts for a much longer period of time to destroy them completely. He gave up on that idea and decided to find a place to dump the rest of the remains instead. Now armed with the information that the murder of Johnny Altinger took place inside the garage, detectives ordered a luminol test to be conducted there. Luminol is a chemical that reacts when it's applied to blood, even in trace amounts. A low blue light will appear wherever blood has come in contact, 
even if it has been cleaned up and is no longer visible to the naked eye. When luminol was sprayed in the garage at 5712 40th Avenue, it glowed as blue as a baboon's butt. Evidence of an impossibly large pool of blood was discovered on the garage floor, and blood had been sprayed over its walls and ceiling. It was clear that a bloodbath had taken place inside Twitchell's garage. On October 31, 2008, Halloween, 39-year-old Mark Andrew Twitchell was arrested for the murder of John Altinger. The evidence against Twitchell included the testimony of Gio Tetro about his attack inside Twitchell's garage, the written confession found on Mark Twitchell's computer, a hand-drawn map found in Twitchell's possession outlining the route from the garage to Johnny Altinger's apartment, the DNA found on the game-cutting tools that was a match to John Altinger, and of course, the blood evidence found at the crime scene. For 18 months, however, investigators still did not have a body. Detectives conducted a meticulous search after discovering another file on a different computer where Twitchell described dumping the remains in a sewer. The information in the file described an alleyway surrounded by a number of telephone poles where Twitchell had dropped the remains down a manhole leading to the sewer. It wasn't much to go on, but they were determined to find it. It took 18 months before investigators were able to find the right manhole and retrieve what was left of the remains from a storm sewer in Edmonton. It was located just one block south of Twitchell's parents' home. An autopsy was conducted to determine whether they were indeed the remains of John Altinger and also to try and determine the precise cause of death. The report stated that although the remains were badly decomposed and incomplete, Examination by a forensic pathologist concluded that multiple cut marks and saw marks were found on the examined bones. Broken bones were also found, although it could not be determined whether these injuries were inflicted pre- or post-mortem. The cause of death, therefore, was recorded as undetermined. But the official report concluded that, quote, the location of the body and the evidence of post-mortem dismemberment make homicide the only probable manner of death. End quote. Nuclear and mitochondrial DNA testing positively identified the remains as belonging to Johnny Brian Altinger. Mark Twitchell's trial began in 2011. After three weeks of testimony in which Twitchell took the stand in his own defense, he was found guilty of the first degree murder on April 12, 2011 and sentenced to 25 years in prison in the Saskatchewan Penitentiary in Prince Albert, Canada. A month after he was sentenced, Twitchell filed a handwritten appeal that he drafted without the help of an attorney, in which he claimed that his case received so much media attention that it was impossible that the unsequestered jury could have remained uninfluenced. He also claimed that his attorneys did not, quote, adequately and satisfactorily address key points regarding his state of mind and credibility, end quote. In February of 2012, Twitchell abandoned his appeal. Journalist Steve Lillibuen covered Twitchell's case for the Edmonton Journal. He corresponded with Twitchell and in 2012 published a book on the case titled The Devil Cinema. Twitchell told Lillibuen that he continued to watch the series Dexter after his conviction. He was able to purchase a flat screen TV for his cell and paid for cable. He watched every episode of Dexter through its final season in 2013. In 2017, Mark Twitchell joined an online dating site for inmates called Canadian Inmates Connect. It costs $35 annually to keep a profile on the site. Those looking to make love matches with inmates can peruse their profiles that includes the inmate's name, age, place of incarceration, and the crimes for which they were convicted. Twitchell's Canadian Inmates Connect profile states that he is, quote, looking for an interesting, intelligent, open-minded, delightfully imperfect woman to relate to and share amusing observations with, as well as potentially a long weekend every few months, end quote. Gio Tetro, who narrowly escaped becoming Mark Twitchell's first victim, also wrote a book. Published in 2016, it is titled, The One Who Got Away, Escape from the Kill Room. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. 
Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative and research assistant is Lorena Garcia, and original music is by Aaron Michael Goldberg. I also want to give a special shout out to a listener, Travis V, for suggesting this series topic as well as the title. Thanks, Travis. As we end the show, I hope you'll listen to a short promo for a fantastic podcast hosted by my friend Oshin Feeney from Ireland. It's titled The Troubles, and I hope you'll check it out. Until next time, be good to one another. The Troubles was a 30-year period in Northern Ireland in which multiple sides and organisations were at war with each other. There were bombings, assassinations, prison breakouts, fanatical leaders, serial killers, and much more. The Troubles podcast is a non-partisan podcast which aims to tell the stories of the Troubles in a digestible way. It's narrated by me, and the episodes are non-sequential, so you can jump in anywhere along the way. It's the perfect podcast for people interested in historical true crime. Season 1 has already been released, and Season 2 will be released throughout 2021, and you can listen wherever you get your podcasts, or by searching The Troubles Podcast on any social media platform.